Okay. Um, are you ready? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, usually, I'm just talking all over the phone, so it's nice to be here in person. Uh, and uh, uh, this presentation is just a brief overview of uh, some of the stuff that uh, Frank and I saw at Embedded Linux Conference Europe. Uh, so, um, just to give you a little uh, feeling for some of the interesting stuff there. Uh, this is my introduction slide, but I think most of you know who I am. Um, uh, one of the things that's on here is I'm the chair of the program committee for ELC Europe, so I'm a little bit biased about uh, the conference and the content. Uh, but I've been working at uh, Sony for about 15 years, and uh, I'm a member of the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board. I've been working for, with Linux for uh, over 26 years, so long time. And then Frank uh, also contributed to this presentation, and uh, that's some of his information. I'm not going to go in detail. Yeah, I'm totally unbiased because I'm only the assistant program chair. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to just go a little bit over review of the uh, an overview of the conference uh, from my perspective. Uh, do a couple of detailed session reports for the sessions that I attended personally. Uh, make a couple of observations on some topic areas, um, and then I'm also going to talk about the automated testing summit uh, that was held just after that event uh, that I was involved with, and then give you some pointers to some resources. So in the in the way of an overview. Uh, it was, this year was a little bit different in terms of the, the talks that were submitted in the CFP. Uh, there were a couple of hot topic areas that were new, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Sony involvement. I will, uh, full admission here, this presentation was given internally to Sony, so there were so many people who were interested. I don't know if you guys are, care how much Sony was involved, but... Um, and then uh, I will talk a little bit about the technical showcase. So uh, ELC Europe was held in Scotland this year, uh, actually the second time we've been in Scotland. It was co-located with the Open Source uh, Summit Europe and the Open IoT Summit Europe. Um, there were lots of smaller events co-located with this as well, the Security Summit, KVM Forum, Forum Linux uh, Kernel Maintainer Summit, I think there was Yocto Developers Dev Days. Um, and I heard of lots of, there was security, uh, there were all kinds of things going on that week. Um, there were about 2,000 attendees, so it was a big conference, uh, and 800 of them were there for ELC Europe. So it was pretty, pretty well attended. Um, the great news is that almost all of the ELC E sessions were recorded. And I think there's only one ELC Europe session that was not recorded, and they're available on YouTube. And if you just go to the presentations page, so if there's any of the topics you're interested in, you can, you can go uh, see those. Uh, this is the conference center. It's kind of a fisheye view of the conference center. It's, it's a, that's actually a flat building. Uh, or is it? I don't know. Uh, that's Jim Zemlin, uh, who often gives the keynotes at, at these events. Uh, he's the uh, director of the Linux Foundation. And so, uh, just consists of a lot of people in rooms uh, listening to presentations. Uh, it's very crowded. And uh, we actually had some nice big rooms for the embedded section. Uh, we were in three rooms in the basement. We did better. Uh, there, there, because the, I think there were a total of like 15 tracks with all the different events going on. And we were lucky we got some good rooms for our tracks. There were some people that were put into a shared space that was a little bit weird. Um, so some of the hot topics, uh, there were 58 sessions in BOFs at, uh, at uh, ELC Europe. Some of the hot topics were there were a lot of kernel driver and development issues. Uh, that's kind of normal, but this time there was more focus on camera and audio. Uh, in the past, we haven't had so many on camera and audio. Uh, we always have a bunch of Yocto projects, so that's uh, not really new. Uh, but there was some real time, uh, there's a bunch of testing content, and that may be because I'm kind of biased towards testing these days. Uh, and then security and networking, and something kind of a new uh, topic that kind of showed up this year. So we had several, um, we had two talks, and I think we may have had a couple that did not get approved on AI and deep learning. So that is starting to show up in, uh, in embedded uh, product designs. Uh, so I think that's pretty interesting. That's, in, that's a new trend. 
This is just a partial list of the different topic areas. Uh, so there are a lot of different topic areas, a lot of things overlapping with IoT, stuff with uh, OpenCV, uh, RISC-5, uh, safety critical, there was a fair number of safety critical things, uh, some audio things, video for Linux, um, so a lot of different territory on the topics. Uh, in terms of Sony involvement, uh, Frank and I are on the program committee. Uh, Frank presented uh, BOF of Device Tree, uh, and then Frank and I and uh, other members of the program committee did the closing game. And we had uh, a couple of people involved in the technical showcase. Uh, Paul Jones and uh, Yamamoto. Uh, um, Yamamoto-san was not present, but helped support this uh, particular showcase, which is a TV tuner that, uh, that Sony had worked on and that we demoed there. Um, and then something that was uh, not really embedded, but kind of interesting, is that uh, they announced at uh, this conference the creation of a new organization, the Academy Software Foundation. Uh, so and this refers to the motion picture uh, Arts Academy in the United States. Uh, well, it's actually it's an international academy, but it focuses on um, movie tools and technology for movie creation. And so Sony Pictures uh, joined uh, that uh, academy, um, and that was announced at this event. Um, in terms of the technical showcase, uh, this is one of our developers from the UK, and he's demoing some stuff there. So this is kind of what it looks like at the showcase poster sessions. Uh, this is a poster talking about a TV tuner board and uh, the fact that we were very, very proud of this, this sentence here, which that the driver was already upstream. So it's in the, the driver for that hardware was already in the Linux kernel and available for download. Yep. Uh, yeah. I mentioned that in my previous talk that there was an LTSI session in the technical showcase. That's what the poster looked like, something like that. The, the sort of information that is available. Yeah. So here's here's the sessions that I actually attended. So out of 58 sessions, because they're running in parallel, you can't get to all of them. And I had side meeting as well, so I wasn't able to see them all. So I, I was able to actually get to 12 sessions out of 58. Um, and this is the list, but I'll go through them really quick, really quickly. So, and one of the ones I wanted to comment on was not an individual session, but a keynote. So John Corbett often does a, a keynote, and this is a really good one to look at. He does just kind of an overview. It's not embedded specific, uh, but he had some good commentary on Meltdown Inspector and uh, how the kernel security process works and uh, how it kind of, uh, we didn't do as well as we would have liked when in the initial handling of Spectre and Meltdown, but things have improved. Uh, he talked about the long-term stable model and talked a lot about BPF, uh, which is Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, and then uh, he couldn't avoid talking about the code of conduct issues. So I don't know if Frank discussed this, but uh, this fall uh, there was a new code of conduct introduced. Uh, Linus took a break and there was a lot of people with lots of questions and uh, a lot of comments. And uh, I think he had a good... Uh, comment on that, talked about that uh, the whole thing is part of maturing and making the uh, community more professional and the goal is still to have fun. Uh, so um, uh, another, another session I went to was on a tool called Devos uh, and that's a tool uh, for creating Debian binary images um, and it can create images for lots of different architectures. Uh, in particular it starts with a base Debian uh, platform image and a set of binary packages and then you can select the things that you want. So um, there was a lot of details in this session about exactly how it does this. It, um, it actually, it, when you're building a distribution and installing all the binary pieces, you have to have root access and as a regular user you might not have that on your host machine and so it uses QEMU uh, to do to do some of the operations as well as something called fake machine to give you a root access. Um, uh, but it's an interesting system uh, with recipes for some common boards. So like for you, can, I believe one of them was a Raspberry Pi. So you can go out and create a custom Debian image for a Raspberry Pi board uh, based on this. And 
And uh, so as recipes are built up in this, I think it'll possibly be a useful system. Um, again, this is building from binary packages, not from source, uh, which is different than some of the other Debian uh, systems that are used in embedded. Uh, and then I went to a talk by Jan Simone. Uh, uh, Jan is with the Automotive Grade Linux project, and they have uh, experimented with a lot of different test frameworks. They're currently, in their main automotive grade lab, they're currently using a combination of test frameworks, including Lava and Fuego. Um, he gave a good overview of uh, several different test systems, including Fuego, P-Test, uh, Lava. P-Test is the Yocto project test frame. Oh, well, it's the test features of the Yocto project. Kernel CI, lab written R4D. And what was really good about this session was that he went over the pros and cons for a lot of different sessions. Uh, so I took note of the Fuego pros and cons because uh, I work on Fuego. <laughs> so, um, so some of the things he said about Fuego was that we have lots of prepackaged tests, uh, we have low, very low requirements on the target, and uh, we include lots of results parsers. Uh, but the things he didn't like about Fuego was that it re requires local SSH access. That's, I guess, not true of some other systems. Uh, assumes the board is already installed and running, so Fuego doesn't really do board provisioning, and other systems did. And we don't support board scheduling, so we don't have, you can't select from a pool of boards um, uh, the way you can, like in Lava. Um, but uh, in general, even though he had both positive and negative things to say, about each one. These, these types of talks I think are very, very useful uh, because if you're a maintainer for one of these systems, or um, it's helpful to see what problems people have with them. Uh, also, um, it helps you to see kind of the strengths and weaknesses compared to other projects, which you may not, unless you research it yourself or try to play around with it yourself, you're not going to find that out. Um, another talk I went to which I thought was, uh, was pretty good was uh, one on CVE tracking. I don't do CVE tracking, but almost almost every company that uses embedded Linux has to track uh, CVEs, which are, I can't remember what they're called, something, I don't know, do it, anybody know what CVE means? Uh, anyone? Um, so uh, for products, especially if you're doing products, you don't want securities uh, vulnerabilities to be left at the field, so you have to upgrade uh, with patches to fix these. and. Uh, it turns out that uh, there's a lot of uh, complexity in the process of dealing with CVEs. There's not just a single place where they're reported. Uh, you have to track multiple places, and you also have to kind of assign uh, the bug, the patches and the commits that address the CVEs, figure out what they are in order to make sure that you're covering them. Uh, so um, I can't remember what uh, company David Reyna works for. I think it might have been Intel. But it was, uh, it was one of the major companies, and they've come out with, or it might have been River River, uh, they've come out with something called SR Tool, which is a security response tool, and it uh, actually manages some of that complexity for you. So it, uh, uh, it implements best practices for tracking the upstreams for the CVE reports, and uh, it's, it's uh, very useful for uh, doing guide, what they call guided tree dodge of incoming CVE reports. So if you have a security developer that's in charge of managing CVEs for your company, this is a tool I think that's worth looking at. Uh, then I went to a, yes, CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, uh, David Wind River. Ah, uh, Wind River. So I was, that was pretty good. Web, winds. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then the next session I went to was a BOF about embedded update tools. So this was not a prepared presentation. Uh, this was just a discussion that was led. Um, and I, I don't know if all the boss were recorded. I think this one probably was recorded, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, they took notes during the boss and put them on, uh, I guess, this uh, GitHub site. Um, and so uh, uh, this was by Jan Lube. And he asked the audience what types of dis uh, things they wanted to discuss. Some of the top discussion items that people talked about were how to migrate user data uh, across a system update, um, and alternatives to AB updates. So most, most products use what are known as AB updates, where you have a full uh, previous system and the full next system on the installed at the same time. Uh, but you can't do that on a resource-constrained device, and so there are some um, techniques for managing that. 
And then also detecting a successful update, uh, and then uh, how to do delta updates. So again, for resource constrained device, devices, uh, there are some tools that allow you to do both binary diffs um, and other types of diffs uh, to limit the amount of bandwidth you need to use or the storage you need to use. Um, and then one that I was really interested in that was had to do with testing was uh, was this one grabbing AV in a board farm. Uh, Christoph uh, Oplosiak is from Samsung, and uh, so one of the things that you may want to do if you're testing stuff is you may want to actually test the video. Well, it turns out that uh, video testing hardware is fairly expensive, uh, but these guys figured out how to use a very very cheap thirty dollar board uh, to do the same thing. It turns out that. Uh, when you go to a, a retail store and they have all these TVs displayed, uh, they don't run wires to every TV. They use a little uh, cheap Wi-Fi transfer board to transfer the image to all of the different uh, televisions. And so uh, it turns out that you, they're, they're inexpensive. They're not built for this testing purpose, but they can be used for that. Uh, so he talked about some of the hardware issues with this, um, having to do with HDMI, and how you have to spoof some of the values in order to get this working. Um, he mentioned another solution that was open hardware um, that did multi-video capture, but it's a very expensive board. It's $430 per board, and you really need one board per uh, device under test. So he talked about maybe taking that open hardware and simplifying it, but for now, this, this cheap board um, uh, is a good trade-off. It didn't have all the features they wanted, but it, uh, but made up for it by being inexpensive. Um, and then I went to a, a talk uh, by uh, Carl Eric Moles from Sony Mobile, uh, and he was talking about, uh, this This was not a technical talk, this was more open source governance. Talked about the different areas of handling OSS and uh, how a company migrates from uh, kind of minimal working with OSS uh, up, in, up into mature. There's kind of five levels of maturity, and they developed a model in Europe for uh, how this is done, and he had some uh, uh, good case studies for how a company moves and becomes more mature about uh, working with open source. Uh, and then I uh, did another testing talk. Uh, this one was by Tim Orling of Intel, uh, and he talked about how you can instrument existing uh, test systems uh, with uh, additional data that makes it easier to parse the parse the output uh, for uh, like lava and fuego and others other things that need to, to scan that and so uh, this is actually a really useful thing that they're working on pushing upstream to uh, the ones he talked about were pi test uh, this bats and p test um, and then there was a talk on real time testing with fuego is motai san here. So, yeah, so he gave a good talk on, uh, over, had a good overview diagram for Fuego, but he talked about F-trace capture uh, during cyclic test, and uh, had said it was easy to identify the latency problems in the graph of uh, the results, um, and he had made modifications to cyclic test uh, uh, for not exiting when the breakout value was detected, and uh, was talking about trying to push those changes upstream. Uh, and uh, I asked him after the session if we could possibly get those changes for Fuego, and he said he was working on it. So, um, and then uh, the interesting thing was that how it used F trace in a snapshot mode to capture a, a subset of the trace during the, and so you could uh, identify easily what was going on in the kernel uh, when the when uh, the overrun or the latency problem occurred. Um, and I just made a note to myself that actually uh, this is a really interesting uh, way to use F-Trace and it would be a good candidate as a general model for a generic Fuego monitoring system uh, that I've been thinking about for a while. So I need to get back with Motaisan and talk more about that. Um, and then I went to year 2038. Uh, uh, and uh, this one was really about, I, I think this has been discussed before, the kernel uh, actually used to have a year 2038 problem. Uh, but by, the, by next summer, it should not. So all of the kernel changes required to fix this particular issue uh, should be taken care of. But we still have quite a bit of work uh, in 
uh, outside the kernel. So we have to fix the C library, we have to fix some distros and some aspects of file systems to handle um, the year 2038 correctly. If you're not familiar, the year 2038 problem is when the 32-bit counter for the number of seconds in Unix uh, will overflow. And uh, so you'd think that now, since we're pr predominantly using 64-bit systems, it wouldn't be an issue, but, uh, but it is. And uh, 2038 is only 20 years away. So <laughs> seems, it may seem to you early to be working on something that's 20 years away, but uh, there might be products that you're designing today that if hopefully if they last 20 years, like if it's a train system or a, a, you're putting Linux in a bridge or something, uh, you want to make sure that it, it, it doesn't miscount the seconds in the bridge in 20 years from now. I don't know, <laughs> making this stuff up. Um, then I, because I have a soft place in my heart for size presentations, I went to a session on Pokey Tiny. Um, this was by Alejandro Hernandez, uh, reviewed Pokey Tiny uh, features and sizes. So Pokey Tiny is something that was started uh, about seven years ago uh, in the Yocto project. And uh, he had a lot of good information about the current status of Pokey Tiny. Um, and uh, they use, in, so Alejandro is from Xilinx. They use an internal distro called Petalinux, uh, which they provide to their customers that has tools for working with FPGAs. Um, and so they had, it was a kind of a heavyweight image and they wanted to make it smaller. And so they uh, used some of the features and some of the attributes of Pokey Tiny and uh, converted it from uh, from what they refer to as Petalinux image full down to a minimal image. So they went from a 28 meg system with 42 second boot time down to a 7 meg system with a 4 second boot time. So that was a big improvement and no loss of functionality. So it still had all of the tools, all of the libraries and, and features necessary to support their tools for their customers. Um, so uh, it's a, a good presentation to talk about the issues that they ran into and how they solved them. Uh, and that was it for the technical sessions. And then I did my closing game. Uh, this is me styling a really nice shiny shirt. <laughs> but uh, we did the normal, we played uh, rock, paper, scissors with 400 people. That's what we do. Uh, one of the things I think it's worth mentioning is that uh, when we go to these conferences, uh, it, it is about going to sessions and learning things. Uh, but you can get some of the sessions online uh, what's really Im another important attribute is this what we call the hallway track um, and that's where uh, you can sit down and talk to people or just stand up and, and converse with other people and maybe uh, talk about the issues that you're facing and, and uh, get ideas for how to solve them um, and give ideas for how to solve other people's things. Um, so uh, I had lots of hallway meetings there. Uh, we met like a lot of Linux Foundation people. Uh, actually, in, ended up talking to Jim Zemlin in the hallway about the code of conduct issue. Uh, talked to several of the other uh, tab members, um, and also some of the other uh, Linux leaders like James Bottomley or uh, Peter Zilstra and, uh, and others. So uh, it's a good place to interact with people that you don't uh, uh, outside of an email setting. Um, let's see. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm going to skip over this. <laughs> so anyway, um, let's see. Uh, so if you, if you go to a conference, I think it's good to look up ahead of time who else might be at that conference or to kind of know who in advance who's going to be at that conference and, uh, and schedule time to talk to people. Uh, you, you, know, you can't count on just running into people. The conferences have gotten so big. Uh, in fact, it was very frustrating in Portland this last year uh, I thought I would, it used to be that I would could kind of count on running into people, uh, but there were several people who I knew were at the event and I just didn't ever see them in the hallway because it was the traffic issues. Um, so it, sometimes it's good to have that uh, communication ahead of time to make sure that you can run into people or have a conversation. Um, uh, and then sometimes uh, you may, uh, be able to communicate with people even if you don't go to the event. So we had uh, an example of some Sony engineers last at uh, this summer in June. Uh, they couldn't they couldn't come to the uh, LinuxCon Japan or Open Source Summit Japan, 
but they were able to meet with one of the uh, the maintainer that they were working with at a coffee shop just outside the event. So, so you don't have to pay the event money to get some of the benefits of the event. So that's that's useful to know. Um, and again, it involves communicating and just fi figuring out if someone's going to be at a conference. So if you're if you're working with uh, someone in the Linux kernel community, just ask them, hey, are you going to be at you know such and such an event? And and you can usually set something up. Um, okay, Frank session report. <laughs> Should I do it on your behalf? I think I'll just do it for me. I'll just do it for you. It's just a couple of slides, I think. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Frank noted a couple of areas that are kind of gaining steam. Uh, again, we talked about uh, Linux and safety critical. There's a lot of people trying to put Linux uh, in environments that are safety critical, uh, like automo automobiles um, and in industrial settings. And uh, so there's a lot of, uh, how can I put this? There's a lot of excitement about this and there's a lot of skepticism about this, uh, which means people don't know if they'll be able to get the safety certification. So Linux is a very complicated operating system, uh, but there are people working on it and, uh, and a lot of the issues. Uh, and then the deep learning that I mentioned before, uh, some, uh, there's a lot of deep learning going into OpenCV. Uh, which is the computer vision library. Uh, a lot of companies are using that and now using deep learning for things like depth sensing and, and all kinds of things. Um, and then we had a new audio uh, subsystem uh, went into the uh, into this kernel that was introduced or at least talked about at the session called Soundwire. Um, and then in terms of if you're if you want to know how to contribute patches, this was a good talk. We, we usually have one or two talks that talk about the process of mainlining or the process of interacting with the community. And uh, this talk uh, had, some, had some good ideas on what to do and what not to do. Um, and then data visualization. So I, I've seen Don Foster before talk about some of the data gathering that she does and uh, visualization. Uh, and so Don does research on community behaviors and uh, she looks particularly at the kernel mailing list and the connections between developers and, and that type of thing. And I don't know exactly what she presented here because this is Frank's thing, yeah. but, uh, but you should check this talk out if you're interested in uh, data visualization. Um, okay, now automated testing summit report. Um, so the day after Embedded Linux Conference in Scotland, we had a uh, testing summit. Um, and this was a private summit this time around because uh, there were some people complained that it was private, but it was uh, we only had so much room space that we could accommodate. And so we really couldn't open it up to uh, everyone. We had about 20 different uh, test frameworks represented, uh, which was pretty good. It was organized by me, uh, representing the Fuego Project, and a guy by the name of Kevin Hillman, uh, who's uh, representing the Kernel CI Project. And uh, we, before the event, we did a survey to, to kind of see, uh, to figure out the attributes of a lot of different test framework, kind of where they're, uh, what things they focused on and what things they didn't focus on. Uh, and that was kind of interesting. You can actually go see the survey results. We put all the results online. Um, and uh, the agenda for the summit, of course, the testing is way too broad of an area to cover everything in, in one day. Um, and I said right at the beginning, uh, prepare to be disappointed <laughs> because uh, uh, there's no way that you'll be able to say everything you'd like to say about testing in one day. You know, a lot of these guys have been working on test systems for years and uh, we just had to really be uh, quick and concise. And so, but what we did was we did try to come up with a common glossary and a diagram of the continuous integration loop so we'd have kind of a framework to talk to each other. Um, and I think that was uh, very useful. We kind of refined the glossary in, inside, the, inside the meeting. And then we talked about a couple of specific uh, parts of the stack. We came up with, uh, inside the meeting, oh, actually before the meeting in the diagram, we came up with about 20 different uh, APIs that it's possible to define in the CI loop. And we came up with uh, several boxes representing processes, probably about uh, 10 or so boxes representing different elements of uh, the CI. And we, we focused on about five of those. 
the test definition, which is how you define a test, um, and the build artifacts, which is a description of the things that get created when you're building the software for testing. Um, and then the actual test execution API, which is, you, you think this is, uh, this is all really simple, but it turns out that when you start piecing all the pieces together, it's, uh, there's a lot of complexity. And uh, I was reading right before we had the meeting, I was reading about, uh, I think, Kubernetes. And uh, I would have thought that managing VMs was pretty simple, but apparently there's a whole industry around orchestrating this stuff. And I think we'll end up with a similar, th similar thing with testing, that there's going to be an orchestration layer that handles all these complexities. Uh, another thing we talked about is run artifacts, which is the actual outputs from the tests, uh, and uh, how, how the results are formatted. Can they be interchanged, how the data mining occurs, where they're stored, uh, and how they're parsed, how the data is parsed and put into a common format. And then another area we did was talking about board farm standards, which is uh, um, when you're running the test software, you have to manage hardware, and you're managing not just the device under test, but you're managing a lot of uh, auxiliary hardware, things that control the power, things that uh, multiplex the AV channels or the buses. And uh, so we talked about make, coming up with some standards for that. And then uh, finally we did a wrap up trying to look forward to a future meeting. Uh, this is the diagram that we came up with. So the things that we focused on in this meeting uh, were test definitions up here. Uh, this interface E, which is the test execution API. We talked about build artifacts and run artifacts and uh, a little bit about the stuff in here, which is the debt control or the target control, board management layer, and uh, standards for managing external equipment, that type of thing. So interface J we talked about. Um, so uh, we didn't even cover all the other sections, and there's lots of sections that we didn't, we didn't actually make any firm decisions about, about any standards or details of that, but it was just trying to get everybody on the same page and initiate the discussions. The discussions will continue. Um, we, did, we did make one decision, which was to uh, use something called PDU Daemon as the first uh, depth control API. Uh, so we hope that by next year, every major test framework will be using uh, PDU Daemon as its uh, PDU stands for Power Distribution Unit. So for controlling uh, that, that is a project that allows you to control power and it has drivers uh, for lots of different power control units. Um, we're using automated testing at Yakto Project as the mail list. Uh, we're putting our standards on the, uh, automated, on the elix.org under automated testing, so you can go there to look for it. And then we agreed that the next time we want to meet face-to-face -face is in uh, ELC Europe uh, 2019 which will be in France, so uh, basically a year later. But I've already had discussions uh, with, other, with, with uh, subgroups that want to get together uh, earlier than that. So there actually is a group of people uh, that are trying to put together a meeting at Fosdem, uh, which will be in, in February in Brussels. Uh, Lenara wants to hold some meetings in Bangkok in April. And uh, there's a group of uh, uh, testing and fuzzing guys that want to put together another testing meeting in Plumbers in, uh, uh, what is the, Lisbon, I think, in Portugal. So there's a lot of testing meetings going on, a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of territory to cover. So I think uh, there's a lot of interest right now, and uh, I think things are going uh, pretty well. The minutes from the meeting are available. If you want to look at those, you can kind of see uh, they're pretty detailed. You can see who said some specific things. Um, anyway, that's it for the Automated Testing Summit. Uh, our hope is that a couple of years from now, uh, we'll, we'll have lots of interaction between the different things. One of the things I'm really excited about is the possibility that we'll have a common test definition so that multiple frameworks will be able to interchange their tests. Uh, so it would be great if uh, Fuego could run Lava tests and Lava could run Fuego tests. Uh, and so we're just getting started with standardizing that stuff. Um, but I think we're, uh, we've got a good start going. Um, so the resources for ELC Europe, uh, you can see links to slides and videos uh, on the elix.org. 
Uh, you can also, on that same page, you can find the technical showcase posters if you want to see the, the technology that people were showing off. Uh, there's a Linux Foundation playlist. So on, on that first uh, website, you'll see your 2018 presentations. You'll find a link to each, pre each uh, video uh, for each presentation. But there's a couple of things. So the keynotes aren't put on there because uh, the keynotes are really general for the entire event. So if you want to see like John Corbett's talk or there were some other talks that had some uh, content that were rel relevant just to, to the entire audience, uh, you go to the Linux Foundation playlist, which is on YouTube. And then of course you can see all of our content, 13 years worth of content, uh, including videos uh, at uh, just ELC presentations on elinux.org. So does anybody have any questions about Embedded Linux Conference? So I highly recommend if you are wondering about any topic, uh, seriously go to go to here or actually just Google it. Use Google and search for you know elinux.org and some topic area. You can find talks on debugging, on on all kinds of different kernel subsystems, V for Linux. You can find talks on Yocto project um, and build systems in real time. So anything that you're interested in or have questions about, you can usually find a talk. We've accumulated a lot of information over the years. Um, and uh, it's surprising, uh, some of the talks, even though they're old, uh, I, I went back to the very first talk I could find, which was a panel discussion at ELC 2006, I think. And uh, it was Greg Hartman talking about tips for mainlining. And it was still it was still completely relevant. <laughs> it still had good information in it. So uh, some things change. So some subsystems change, but a lot of the things stay the same. And so the information is still good. Anyway, uh, let's see. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Huh? Oh, got it. So I was talking earlier today about the plumbers conference, different conference. Yeah. And we were encouraging you to come to that. One thing I forgot to mention was that conference is limited. In in size and it sells out so do not wait till the last minute to buy your your conference pass to that conference yeah one one big problem with plumbers is you have to kind of decide to go to it well before you know what's going to be in it <laughs> and a well before the open opening of the registration uh, because if you wait until registration opens to ask your boss for travel permission, it's too late. Uh, your boss won't respond in time for you to register. <laughs> so you have to kind of be looking ahead. For some of these events, you really have to be planning ahead uh, to get the permission ahead of time to go to them. So, okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. So,